Well, good morning and welcome to Cross Community Church today. Uh, I'm excited because we're starting a new series called The Wind and the Waves. And what we're going to look at are the, the storms that we face in life. And the question we want to answer for you is how do we remain faithful when life gets hard, when there are difficulties that we're inevitably going to face? How do we remain faithful as disciples of Jesus Christ who claim Jesus as our Lord? How do we remain faithful when life gets it's difficult. When I was a kid, I uh, went on a snow skiing trip with uh, my friend Josh Schneider, and his dad made the mistake of coming in one morning and saying, hey guys, you may not want to go out to the slopes today. Uh, I hear that there's a storm going to, to come, and so there, it may be like blizzard conditions and a lot of wind or whatever, and of course, when you're a, a teenage boy, your chest puffs up a little bit, and we're like... We're here to ski in the snow. What's the big deal if it's snowing, right? And so we take off on the bus, and we head to the slopes, and we, we get there, and it's starting to snow just a little bit. And we're like, all those adults sitting back at the condo. Like, how lame are they? It's a ski trip. You go skiing, right? So we get on the lift, and as we begin to head up the mountain, we're gaining some elevation. The blizzard hits. And it's not just one of those marginal, kind of heavy snow kind of things. It was blowing so hard that we had to yell to hear each other, and we're seated next to one another on the ski lift. And, and it was uh, so much snow that I could barely make out his form, and he's right next to me. So the ski lift does the only logical thing to do when there's a blizzard on the ski slopes. They shut down the lift. And the problem was that I was still on the lift. And so these really uh, overly prideful young teenage boys uh, began to shrink back just a little bit. Our pride was no longer swelling. We were, uh, instead, we were shivering and thinking, are they ever going to start it back? And so finally they did, and they'd move forward just a little bit at a time to let people off of the lift. And so Josh and I were like, hey, you're on the mountain in a blizzard, you just ski back down, maybe we'll take it later this afternoon. So we take off in, in what is a whiteout, we can't see very well, and we're doing our best to follow the, the trail, which are generally wide, not hard to find, but in a whiteout, it's a lot more difficult than you might think, and so I'm thinking, all right, we're making our way down the mountain, if we can kind of get through this, I can go inside, I can get warmed up, I'm freezing, um, and we got down to a certain point and realized we'd taken the wrong trail. Now, one would think that when you're at a ski resort, that every trail would ultimately lead to the bottom. I'm here to tell you that's not true. We had to get on another lift, ride back up to the top of the mountain, and then take the correct route home before we kind of tucked our tails and slinked in. And we're like, yeah, we got really tired up there, you know, and everyone's like, yeah, we know what really happened. You're like, you froze to death and you quit. Now, that's kind of a a fun memory from my past, a, a, a stupid thing that I did as a young kid where I nearly froze to death. But the storms that we face in life usually aren't that short. They're not that temporary, and they're not that easy to remedy. If you're here today and you're going through a storm in your marriage, you're wondering, like, are we going to make it? It's likely that storm didn't just blow in yesterday, and it's not going to be gone next week. If you have a, a wayward child who's wandering in their faith, they're going a direction that you don't want them to go, and you don't know how to bring them back, and you've been praying the prayers, and you've been like speaking truth as much as you can, but they're just not coming around. You know, that, that storm didn't blow in yesterday, and it's probably not going to be gone next week. For you, if you're facing anxiety, and fear, maybe you're walking through a storm of depression, you've probably been there for a while probably still going to be walking in a few days and weeks. How do we, as the people of God, who profess to be disciples of Jesus Christ, how do we continue to walk in faithfulness in the midst of a storm that, that again, is probably not that new and it probably won't be gone next week? How do we continue to walk in faithfulness? If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Acts chapter 27. Now, I need to give you guys a lot of background material. There are 28 chapters in Acts, and we're in the 27th, so I'm going to catch you up just as quickly as I can. I'm actually only going to catch you up on Paul's story. So here's what's been going on. Paul was preaching in the temple at Jerusalem, and he's preaching Jesus and him crucified. And if you know, the Jews were not uh, particular fans of the gospel message. They crucified Jesus for claiming to be God, and here's Paul proclaiming Jesus as Lord. So he gets arrested. Um, 
He ends up going before various different governors and rulers, and he's just appeared before King Agrippa. Uh, King Agrippa was kind of the, the ruler over the land, kind of serving under Rome at the time. And King Agrippa hears Paul's case, and he comes to the conclusion that had Paul not appealed to Caesar, which was the right of a Roman citizen, in any given trial or circumstance, you could appeal to be heard by Caesar, and they would grant you that wish. So King Agrippa, hearing Paul's case, he says, you know, it seems like this guy's innocent. Had he not appealed to Caesar, he could go free. So he's about to make a journey from Jerusalem to Rome. If you want to know the distance of that journey, uh, it's about the same distance if you were to travel from one coast of the United States to the other. It's about 2,200 miles Paul was going to travel on this journey, and it was going to be a rocky one. He gets on a, a, a ship at a place called Caesarea, and he begins to travel kind of spot to spot, uh, slowly and quickly on smaller boats. But when he gets to uh, a, a place that we're going to pick up in, he gets on a much larger ship, and they're going to put out sailing across the Mediterranean, headed toward Rome. So here's where we are. Um, verse, uh, verse 9 of Acts chapter 27. They've, they've left in this big Alexandrian ship. And when I say a big Alexandrian ship, there were almost 300 people on board along with lots and lots of cargo. They find themselves sailing in the midst of the Mediterranean Sea in this vast vessel, but they're having a really difficult time on their voyage at this point. Verse 9, uh, they, they're at a place called Fair Havens. Um, it's, it's, do we have the map up there? Can we put the map on the screen? They're at a place called Fair Havens. I'm not sure if you can see that or not. Uh, but basically, they're sheltering on an island. The seas were really rough. They're trying to, to get some smooth sailing, if you will. And they've concluded they can't make it to Rome before winter. So they're looking for a place for safe harbor. Fair Havens was not a suitable harbor for the winter. And so they're like, maybe we can make it to Phoenix. That's where we pick up in verse 9. It says, when considerable time had passed... And the voyage was now dangerous, since even the fast was already over. Paul began to admonish them. Now, Paul is uh, technically a prisoner on this ship. Now, he had, he had found favor with the centurion in charge of the ship. His name was Julius. So I guess Paul thinks... Maybe I'll give him some sailing advice, right? So he's speaking to Julius like, hey, uh, I I've got some words for you. Now, one of the details that Luke, the author of Acts, mentions here uh, as he was on the journey with Paul, as he mentions that this was after the fast. Now, the fast talked about here was the Yom Kippur. It was the Day of Atonement for the Jewish people. And so it was going to be late September or early October when Yom Kippur hit. Now, this is after the fast. Now, it may not mean much to you, but if you had lived around the Mediterranean at this time of the year, you would know that sailing became very dangerous after the middle of September. Here they are in early to mid-October. Sailing, you almost have a death wish if you set out at this point. So Paul, when it says that he admonished them, he was pleading with them. Here's what he says in verse 10. Men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. To show you the kind of clout Paul had at this point, verse 11, but the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than what was being said by Paul. Because the harbor was not suitable for wintering, the majority had reached a decision to put out to sea from there. If somehow they could make it to Phoenix, a harbor of Crete facing the southwest and northwest and spend the winter there. And when a moderate south wind came up, supposing they had attained their purpose, they weighed anchor and began sailing along to Crete, close in shore. Hey, let's just kind of hug the mainland here. Maybe we'll be okay. We got some, some shelter. If we can just get to Phoenix, everything's going to be safe. That's not what happened. Look in verse 14. But before very long, there rushed down from the land a violent wind called a Eurokilo. Now, we don't have these. This is really a Greek word that describes a northeaster. It's, it's similar. It's akin to a hurricane, but it doesn't last just a few days. It is a lengthy, lengthy storm. And while they were just trying to get to Phoenix to harbor there for the winter, they're going to be blown out to sea. 
Verse 15, and when the ship was caught in it, we could not face the wind and gave way to it and let ourselves be driven along, running under the shelter of a small island called Clotta. We were scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. So kind of the p- picture here, uh, they're sailing along, hoping to get to this harbor. The huge storm, hurricane force winds, blows up on this giant ship. And it's so violent that they, they give up sailing. Like they can't control the ship. They're being driven along. And it's so rough that the lifeboat is beating up against the bow of the ship. And they're convinced that one or the other is going to break. And they kind of need both in the midst of a storm. And so they take the lifeboat, they bring it onto deck, and they secure it there. So running under the shelter of a small island called Clotta, we were scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. And after they had hoisted it up, they used supporting cables in undergirding the ship, fearing they might run aground on the shallows of Sirtis. They let down the sea anchor, and in this way, they let themselves be driven along. So they've literally just taken ropes and wrapped them around portions of the ship in order to hold it together so that it won't be broken apart. They've let the anchor down to, to slow them down as they approach the shallows of Sirtis. They're fearing they're going to run aground, and ultimately the ship will be destroyed. This is a pretty difficult situation that they find themselves in at this point. Now verse 18 says, The next day... As we were being violently storm-tossed, they began to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they, sh- they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no storm, no small storm was assailing us, from then on, all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. You know you're in a bad spot on a ship. When the sailors have just abandoned all hope of making a profit on their voyage, the cargo that they were hauling, that was their, they were hauling, that was their livelihood. That was their chance that they were going to make enough money to feed their families later in the year so they, they would make the voyage, sell the cargo, and, and gain a profit. They've given up on making a profit. They threw it into the sea. But it was much worse than that because the sailors had also given up all hope for steering the ship. You see, they, they'd thrown the ship's tackle into the sea, just trying to do anything they could to lighten it, they, that they might be able to weather this storm. They'd thrown all the things that they needed to actually sail and guide the ship. They'd thrown them into the sea. So Paul's on a boat with sailors. who lost all hope of making a profit, lost all hope of steering the ship. They knew that they were out of control. And it goes even further says that all hope of being saved was gradually abandoned. Their situation was pretty desperate. The question I told you I wanted to answer for you today is how do we remain faithful in the midst of the storm? Their condition, the condition that Paul found himself in as a prisoner aboard this vast ship, uh, it was dire. Hope was lost that they could even be saved. They're, 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 they're trying to see through the storm, make it through the other side. They'd given up that hope. So I want to answer this question for you. How do we remain faithful in the midst of the storm? Um, number one, we remember that God is sovereign over the storms. Look what it says here in verse 21. It says, when they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up in their midst and he said, Men, you ought to have followed my advice and not set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. This is a, a New Testament, I told you so, right? Paul was like, hey, remember when I said something about not sailing um, and they weren't ready to listen uh, at that point? Paul's just reminding them. that I kind of called this one. I told you guys what was going to happen. Verse 22, yet now I urge you to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night, an angel of, God, of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me, saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe, that, I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. Now, if, if you're just standing on the deck of the ship and you don't know Paul and you don't know God, you're thinking, how can this guy know anything? 
I mean, what was really clear is that the sailors had given up all hope of steering the ship themselves. Like, safety was a, a distant hope if any was left. They were gradually abandoning all hope of being saved. They'd thrown the tackle overboard. They'd thrown the cargo overboard. The ship is lost. And then this bold guy named Paul, who's never sailed a ship before as far as they know, uh, he stands up. He's like, hey, guys, don't worry. My God told us we're all going to be safe. So you should just kind of relax. Everybody settle in. My God has got this. And yet, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, a disciple of God, you know that he is indeed sovereign over the storms. And not just over the storms, but he is sovereign over every single detail that happens in every single place at every single time on the earth, all at one time. Our God is sovereign over all. And God was going to see Paul through this storm. Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage. And Paul says, for I believe, God, that it will turn out exactly as I've been told. We must run aground on a certain island. If we're going to remain faithful as believers in Jesus Christ, in the midst of the storm, we've got to remember that God is sovereign over every step we take, over every single moment that we're going to live in, over every bit of suffering we might otherwise endure, our God is sovereign. You remember Jesus, the Son of God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. As he walked on this earth, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was going to go through the storm of betrayal by one of his closest Friends, he was going to walk through the storm of false accusations and an unjust conviction. He was going to walk through the storm of brutal beating and mocking. Jesus was going to walk through the storm of crucifixion on a cross. And Jesus was going to endure the storm of the grave. Now I want you to Try to go back in time a little bit. Imagine you were a disciple of Jesus. You'd walked with him. You'd met him. You've come to recognize that he was indeed the Son of God. He was the Savior. He was the Messiah. You'd walked with Jesus, and you'd seen him heal the blind and make the lame walk, the deaf to hear. You'd seen the miraculous, and you're a, you're a follower of Jesus. And then, then one day in the garden, you see him, and he gets arrested. And then all the other disciples, they abandon him. You stood in the crowd when Pilate said, hey, do you want Barabbas to be released to you, or do you, should I release this man, Jesus? And the crowd shouted that Barabbas might be released, and they began to chant, crucify him, crucify him. But you're a disciple, and you believe he's the Son of God, and so you're hanging on to faith. You hear as he's condemned, and you watch as he takes step after step after step toward the cross. And I, I couldn't, I don't think we could help that our faith might waver in that moment as you saw Jesus nearing the cross with the Roman soldiers, the executioners all there, the crowds watching. I wonder what would happen to our faith, right? I wonder what happened to our faith as they began to drive the nails through his wrists and through his ankles. What would happen is he was lifted up there on the cross. I wonder what would happen to our faith in the midst of the storms that Jesus endured when he cried out and he breathed his last breath. I wonder what would happen to our faith. They took his body down off the cross and they placed him in a tomb. Day one comes and he's still there. And day two comes and he's still there. If we understood that God was sovereign over every single step and every single storm in our lives, our faith would have remained secure. Because the greatest act of Jesus 
was overcoming the storm of the grave. On the third day, he was raised, and we realized that what Jesus did there was to secure his glory forever and the good of the whole world. What he'd done there on the cross was make a sacrifice for our sin that we might be able to enjoy God and reign with him forever. What God was doing in the midst of that storm was working everything for our good and his glory. And can I tell you that the same is true with you. Your steps are going to look different. Your suffering might be different. Your storm is going to have a different set of circumstances. But in every single step, our sovereign God is working it for your good and his glory. And so we can remain faithful in the midst of the storm when we remember that God is sovereign over that storm, that what we are facing today was known by God before the foundations of of the world. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 139, verse 16, he says to God, He says, Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. God knew every step you would take, every day you would live, every storm you would face before you breathed your first breath here on this earth. The storm you're facing isn't here to destroy you. It isn't here just to make you miserable. The storm you are facing is a part of God's greater plan for your good and for His glory. Believers in Jesus Christ are supposed to be salt and light on this earth. You know, the famous Charles Wesley Uh, He was coming to the United States from England. He was on a ship similar to what Paul was on on this day. And a huge storm comes up. Now, Charles Wesley, he is the chaplain of the ship on which he's riding. And this massive storm comes up such that everyone on the ship was was fearing for their lives. And listen, I'm I'm a pastor. There are some difficult circumstances. You don't have words. I mean, what do you say when you think the ship's going to sink? You're like, well, um... God loves you. What do you say? And so he's in a difficult moment, uh, doesn't know what to say as a chaplain, when he notices a group of German missionaries. They were known as the Moravians. And rather than despairing like everyone else on the boat, these men were gathered up praying and singing hymns. So the great missionary and chaplain of the ship, when they came through the storm, he visits with those Moravians and he says, "Uh, how are you so calm? How did you endure that and just sing hymns and you were so at peace? And they responded, because we have faith in God. They didn't say it in these words, but they pointed that God was sovereign over that storm. And the great Jonathan Wesley recognized then that he didn't have a faith like those men had. He was an ordained minister, chaplain of the ship, and on a missionary journey but he didn't actually have faith in God. And he later came to faith in large part due to those circumstances. Can I tell you that the way that we respond in the midst of our suffering is a testimony to the world around us. We, we studied on Wednesday, like, be ready to give a reason for anyone who asks you, like, how do you have hope in the midst of this circumstance? So we're able to remain faithful in the midst of the storm when we remember that God is sovereign over the storm. Look here in verse 21. When they had gone a long time without food, then Paul stood up in their midst and he said, Men, you ought to have followed my advice and not set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. Yet now I urge you to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you. So this had to be encouraging to the sailors. Like, hey, maybe we're not going to die. I don't know if they trusted God at this point, but Paul did get it right the first time. And now the same guy who said, we're about to hit a storm, this is not going to go well for us, is now saying, hey, I talked with God, he's told me we're all going to be saved. But I bet that hope began to dim. If you look down in verse 27, when the 14th night came, this is no temporary, quick-passing storm. When the 14th night came, as they were being driven about in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors began to surmise that they were approaching some land. 
They took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. And a little farther, they took another sounding and found it to be 15 fathoms. And fearing that we might run aground uh, somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern and wished for daybreak. But as the sailors were trying to escape from the ship, and had let down the ship's boat. This is the lifeboat. The sailors, they're trying to escape from the ship. They let down the ship's boat into the sea on the pretense of intending to lay out anchors from the bow. Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves can't be saved. And the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it fall away. Can I tell you that in the midst of the storms of our life, we can be just like those sailors? And even when God has provided a source of protection, a source of deliverance, a source of provision for us, we can look for our own means of escape. These are sailors. You know what their job is? To sail the ship. To ensure the safe passage of the cargo and the passengers. And yet these sailors on this day, hey guys, we're just going to go let down some more anchors. Nothing to see here. They were secretly abandoning the ship, trying to escape, save themselves, finding their own path out of here because the ship certainly wasn't going to make it. Despite what God had said, they're going to find their own means of escape. How do we remain faithful in the midst of the storm? First, when we remember that God is sovereign over the storm. And number two, we cut away the lifeboats. Verse 32, it says, The soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat, and they let it fall away. Can I ask you a question? When life gets hard, and circumstances are stressful, and the storm drags on, what is it that you're tempted to turn to? Is it alcohol? Just a few drinks to help take the edge off? Maybe for you, it's just a little escape into pornography. Maybe it's a coworker, an old addiction, a hobby, hours spent on social media, giving yourself to Netflix or any other sort of mind-numbing distraction just as a means of escape from what you're suffering. As I read through the story, I was blown away by the fact that God had just given him this massive ship. And he just said, hey, I'm going to bring you through the storm. And these guys instead trusted in the little bitty lifeboat. But isn't that what idols do in our lives? They promise deliverance that they can never produce. They promise us relief. They promise us an escape, but they can never deliver on what they promise. As a matter of fact, our idols that we would turn to, whatever that thing might be in your life and in my life, those idols just really lead to destruction every single time. So Paul says, hey, unless those guys remain on the ship, like we're going to perish. So he tells a centurion who takes fairly dramatic action in the midst of a 14-day storm where they're not sure if they're going to be saved. He cuts the ropes to the lifeboat. For us as believers, we're going to remain faithful in the midst of the storm. Sometimes we have to take dramatic action. We've got to cut the ropes to the lifeboat. We've got to take drastic action against those sinful things that we turn to, to put the, to death the idols of our hearts that we're, we're, we tend to trust in, the, turn, the things that we turn to to try to escape. We cut loose the lifeboats. Jesus in Matthew 5.30 says, If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it from you. It's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than you, for your whole body to go into hell. Sometimes... We treat these idols, these sinful tendencies in our life like, ah, it's really not that big of a deal. Hey, let's just pull the lifeboat back up and secure it on the deck. And it's an ongoing temptation to trust in something else rather than to trust in God. If we're going to remain faithful in the midst of the storm, sometimes we've got to cut the ropes to the lifeboat. We've got to take drastic action against our sinful, the sinful tendencies of our hearts. 
We remember that God is sovereign over the storms. We cut away the lifeboats. And the final thing here is that we trust in the provision of God. Verse 33, until the day was about to dawn, Paul was encouraging uh, them all to take some food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you've been constantly watching and going without eating, having taken nothing. So these guys, for 14 days, they're paying attention to the storm. That's their focus. Like, their their focus, obviously, like, is the ship going to sink? Are we taking on water? Are we going to run aground? Can we help fix this situation? That's been their only focus for 14 days. And Paul's like, hey, You haven't eaten in quite some time. It's time for you to take some food like you need to eat. Verse 34, I encourage you to take some food, for this is for your preservation. For not a hair from the head of any of you will perish. And having said this, he took bread and he gave thanks to God in the presence of all, and he broke it and began to eat. And all of them were encouraged, and they they themselves also took food. And all of us in the ship were 276 persons. I told you it was a big ship. When they'd eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship by throwing out the wheat into the sea. And when the day came, they could not recognize the land, but they did observe a bay with a beach. And they resolved to drive the ship onto it if they could. Casting off the anchors, they left them in the sea, while at the same time, they were loosening the ropes of the rudders and hoisting the foresail to the wind, and they were heading for the beach. There's one more little obstacle here. But striking the reef where the two seas met, they ran the vessel aground, and the prow stuck fast and remained immovable. And the stern began to be broken up by the force of the waves. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners so that none of them would swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to bring Paul safely through, kept them from their intention and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land. And the rest should follow, some on planks and others on various things from the ship. And so it happened that they were all brought safely to land. How do we remain faithful in the midst of the storm? We trust in God's provision. Temptation was to take the lifeboats, to find some other way out, and yet God had provided the means of their escape. There was food on the ship that they were going to nourish their bodies with for the remainder of their journey. And even when the bow of the boat was stuck fast there on the rocks and the ship began to be broken up, God provided for them planks of wood and various other things that would serve for their deliverance so that all of them would be safe. Can I tell you that God has made provision for you in the midst of the storm? So God has given us his word to be our guide, to sustain us, that we can read about men like Paul who remained faithful in the midst of the storm. We can be encouraged in the word. We can know the steps that we should take. He's given us the provision of his Holy Spirit that in every single moment of our lives, no matter how good or how bad, we can walk in love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. That is the provision that we have in the Holy Spirit of God. The final thing that God's given us. Is the provision of his church. We need each other. Sometimes we need people to stand up and just encourage us and speak the truth to us in the midst of our difficulty to minister to us. So as the church of Jesus Christ in a year like 2020, and it's been a year, how do we remain faithful in the midst of the storm? We remember that God is sovereign over the storms. We take care to cut away the lifeboats that might be there. And then we trust in the provision that God has made for us. We keep walking the path that God has marked out for us, knowing that everything we're going through is for our good and his glory. Would you pray with me? Father, we're thankful for your word for how you teach us and for how you encourage us. We're thankful for the provision of your Holy Spirit that we don't have to walk according to the fear and anxiety of our flesh, but we can walk and trust in your spirit and your power. Father, I'm thankful for the provision of the church, the men and women that come around that help stir us on to point us toward the truth that when we're discouraged, they can remind us of your goodness. So Father, I pray for this church today. For every man and woman here, Lord, I don't know the storms that that they're walking through, but you do. Father, I pray that you give us the grace to remember your sovereignty over the storm. Give us the grace to cut away the lifeboats, the silly things we trust in other than you.
Give us the grace to enjoy your provision for our lives. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.